Great. So, um, well, thank you very much, first of all, for um, speaking with uh, the Young Feminist War. So um, maybe you can just start by uh, introducing yourself. Okay, so my name is Ronald King, and I am the founder and director of Life and Leggings. The full name of the organization now is Life and Leggings Caribbean Alliance Against Gender-Based Violence through Education, Empowerment, and Community Outreach. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cool. And um, Ronald, maybe can you tell me where uh, this idea of uh, life in leggings or the hashtag life in leggings came from? Well, it came from personal experiences and also from out of frustration. Um, the discussions that you would have with um, men online about um, male enticement and male fragility, um, as well as my personal experiences of sexual harassment and sexual violence. Um, my, my One of my most, um, I would say, one of the experiences I was most vocal about was when last year, when I was on my way to work, when um, a guy had slowed down to offer me a ride, mm -hmm. and I declined. Um, and he then tried to pull me into the vehicle. So what I did was that I ran from the bus stop because I was on my way to work and I ran in the opposite direction. I ran to a friend's house who then um, allowed me to use the phone to call my workplace to let them know that I'd be late because I was on my way to the police station. And when I got to the police station, I was met with this nonchalant attitude. They didn't seem interested in taking any statement right. and they basically asked me what did I expect them to do. So I left a little bit, obviously distraught. So... Um, and then other things happening throughout the year, like just experiencing increased sexual harassment, uh, walking along my business throughout the streets of Bridgetown, Barbados. And um, this is a feeling of overwhelm, this feeling really overwhelming, the feeling of despair. I, I think the breaking point was also just, we had at that time um, a woman who had shared her experience of someone breaking into her house Mm. Um, to rape her and it just it was a triggering experience to me it just all the memories just came flooding right back all my experiences and I said you know what I think we need to address this because the comments that was under her her story some were of um, support but there were a lot of victim blaming comments and a lot of slut shaming as well and I when I see those kinds of things, I'm very vocal about them, and I try to um to offer my opinion and try to dispel those myths and debunk those theories and just offer my arguments. But you were being, I was being met with um comments that were just disregarding all the all you know the points that I was listing um about why. So no one should break into someone's house to rape them. I mean, there's no, obviously there's no reason, there's no justification for something like that. And they were kind of like defending it, you know, blaming her. So I said, perhaps if we shared our experiences on a hashtag, um, they would be able to see how pervasive this is, how almost every woman that they know has had an experience of, you know, sexual violence. Hmm. And so tell me a bit more about the, the hashtag. So you launched this hash, hashtag, and what happens next? Um, so we launched the hashtag on the 24th of November. And um, it, it went viral in Barbados in, in 24 hours. By day two, it went to Trinidad and Tobago, Dominica, and it was starting to go into Jamaica. But by day three, four, it had taken over 11 Caribbean countries. Um, so... Or after, after you know, the discussion because it was a lot of discussion going on online. We tried, we started to transfer the conversation from on online to offline. We had our live panel, and now we're beginning our projects. We registered the organization as a charity, and our first project would be the upcoming March on March eleventh. So tell me a little bit more about the the reaction because you're, you're you're mentioning that it went viral, you know, very quickly, and that it reached many different 
Caribbean uh, women who were able to share their experience. So what what is it about that hashtag and the experiences that brought that for you brought these people together? Um, I think it was feminine solidarity because it wasn't just women sharing their experiences. You had women who who never met each other, who who probably will never meet each other. Um, reaching out to them and saying thank you for sharing mm. that your experience helped me to share my own story or helped me to come to terms with my story or um, rather made me feel as though I was not alone. There were like there was this this these two girls who um, they had similar experiences, so they messaged each other and they said, "Well, this happened to me too. Almost, it's almost like if I'm reading my own story." Mm-hmm. And then they messaged me afterwards and said, "Well, they decided that they would be healing buddies for each other." And what what was the healing buddies exactly? Just so people understand a bit more. Um, well, they helped each other through, just talk about it, um, help each other through the experience, and um, seek counseling together to be a pillar of support for each other. So um, very much in solidarity with each other. Yes. Yeah. And um, then you had experiences where um, women who were afraid to share um, as vocally as others did um, because, you know, social media is very public. And so what they did was that they opened their inboxes for other women and mm-hmm. shared it anonymously. It, we, we offered the feature first, and then um, regular women, they were opening, offering to open their inbox. Some persons created anonymous forms to them to send their stories through so that they could um, have complete anonymity. And um, yeah, so it was just feminine solidarity all around. And then for those who just were afraid to share at this point in time, but felt as though they would share later, You had women just saying to them, it's okay to heal at your own pace. Because we're sharing doesn't mean that you're not brave. Right. We're standing with you. We support you. And so tell me more about the march. Um, It's uh, reclaiming our streets um, and reclaiming space. So tell me more about the upcoming march uh, on March 11th. Okay, so on some of the, the on the hashtag, um, some of the stories you had uh, experiences of street harassment, and um, even in the busiest of spaces, you would still be harassed, or worse off, you'd be um, assaulted. So it is reclaiming, as you said, those spaces, saying that we deserve to exist in these spaces without fear of sexual violence or street harassment. Um, so. We are joining in solidarity across um, the Caribbean in seven is seven Caribbean countries that are marching. There are others that will be participating, but they will not be marching um, because I guess they came on a little bit too late, but they still want to participate. Mm-hmm. Um, we're joining in solidarity for survivors of gender-based violence in memory of the girls and women that we've lost and for and to reclaim the streets to make them safe again for the future generations of women and girls to come. And uh, what's the importance of having the march um, at this point in time? Um, and and also the fact that it's, it's happening simultaneously across uh, different, uh, you, you were saying seven uh, Caribbean countries. Well, um, it's important at this time because um, across the region, in Barbados, we don't... Um, we don't have murders like how, like right now, how Trinidad and Tobago is happening. But we are all one Caribbean region. We're all, our experiences are similar because of, you know, the our colonial past. But, um, and the, how we socialize the Caribbean male, the aggressive behavior, that, that kind of um, similarities that we share. But it's important that, the women of Trinidad and Tobago um, don't feel alone, that there are other women in other Caribbean countries that are standing in solidarity with them and saying that we see you, we stand with you. And across the other Caribbean islands like Jamaica and um, countries like Guyana who are experiencing those same murders of um, women and girls. So um, that's the importance of it right now, um, to stand in solidarity with them and 
it the second question was why was it simultaneous Mm -hmm. um because i find that um when when we tend when we're vocal about our issues as individuals or in our individual country we are not taken as seriously as when we put our voices together when we put our voices together we have the potential to make people listen as seen with the hashtag it the effect rippled through the region and internationally you had um magazines in Belgium you had persons in China you had persons in Japan listening to these stories and being uh, affected and um, standing in solidarity with us so when we put our voices together we can create the necessary societal changes that we so desperately need Hmm. and speaking of so desperately needing uh, that uh, in in this current moment in this current current context where where various places around the world are feeling um, you know, a rise in um, right-wing politics, uh, a rise in um, fear, um, xenophobia, racism, all of these different isms, really. Um, yeah. You know, t- t- tell me more about the, the feminist solidarity and, and, and being able to practice solidarity. You were saying, you know, being contacted by, by people in China, you know, that, like, it's, it's amazing to have that. Um, but what does it mean to, to be able to, to have that in, in this current context? I think, um, it's, well, for our, our movement, it's, it's an intersectional feminist movement. So personally for, for me and the team that we have, um, it's important for us to show that we represent all women and that they have a voice and a space within the movement, especially with all that's going on. Um, in our march, we have speakers for um, Be Glad, which is an LGBTQ movement. We have a speaker from the Barbados Association of Muslim Ladies. We have um, a speaker from the None in Three Project to speak of why it's important to um, change the statistic from one in three women will experience sexual or physical violence to none in three. So, um, with all that's going on, I think I think it's important, especially for those who are marginalized within the already marginalized, to know that they have a voice and they have a space within the movement, and that we represent them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and what would you say? Because I know that um, there's been you know. Um, I was reading when I was reading up about um, uh, the ha- when the hashtag uh, Life in Leggings um, uh, was launched and 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 the conversation that it started online. I know there was backlash. You know there was there were also people who um, were I guess using the the, the popularity of the hashtag to um, you know to troll uh, to to throw. <laughs> vitriol and shade and um so what what does that mean as well to to be able to be on the receiving end of that well it was expected i mean (laughs) any any movement that represents marginalized people privileged people tend to be offended by it because they see it as um you're infringing on their so-called rights (laughs) or you're taking away rights from them by asking for your own or demanding your own. Like, for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement, you had All Lives Matter. With um, feminism, you had men, menism, menace. <laughs> um, you, you get reactionary um, movements to powerful movements. So when the Life and Leggings hashtag took off, I was not surprised when the guys who, because we expected guys to miss it, or to miss the point of it. I was not surprised when they tried to come up with their own reactionary hashtags, but as you saw, um, because our voices put together were so strong and because the purpose of the hashtag was um, understood and people saw how it was needed, they they tried to um, drown out the misogynistic noise <laughs> with their solidarity. Cool. Um, 
And if you had one, uh, just a final question, I guess, um, uh, one thing that you would want to see as a message uh, coming out of the marches or, or just, you know, anything that you'd like to uh, say about, you know, what you're hoping will come out from these marches on um, March 11th? Well, what we're hoping is that um, everybody will realize that we all have a role to play in eradicating gender-based violence, that the onus is not on women's organizations to eradicate it, but it starts with us individually. It starts with holding your friends accountable for their own actions, as well as general education and awareness of the topics at hand, and also the ways in which, again, the marginalized are marginalized within these um, these spaces, um, like how, as I said, like sex workers here in Barbados. I mean, it's not illegal here, but we tend to, not we, but society of itself tends to um, think that because someone is a sex worker that they don't have the right to say no and that they forego their right to consent. And sometimes it, it, the, the, the rape jokes get worse. Like they... Um, compare them to an item saying that you know like if you rape a sex worker that is almost like just stealing a product like to dispel just to eradicate those <laughs> those ideas those thoughts and to overall just shed awareness on how wrong they are and how um, we as a society need to do better and hold ourselves accountable for the ways in which we perpetrated um, violence against women and girls and how we as a society can come together to prevent and protect um, women and girls and um, create spaces to heal survivors. That the community, it takes a community to, you know, or a village to raise a child to a community to come together and to fix this problem that we have in the region.